no problem. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Hopefully, it sounds like everybody had a good uh, good holiday, and uh, we're all recovering well. And uh, uh, so, uh, wanted to just spend a couple hours with you this morning on uh, this topic. Talk about money a little bit, and and credits, and lending, and and how that relates to the world of cooperatives. Um, I do want to say, sort of, for this presentation. Um, I really appreciate uh, if we can have uh, more of a conversation than a presentation. So I've got a lot of slides and a lot of information to share with folks, but I really appreciate if people have questions, we can uh, stop at any point and, and follow any, any interest you may have. We've got plenty of time, um, so happy to dive into any particulars. Um, I understand, it's my understanding we've got a handful of uh, cooperative endeavors here. And, um, and across a couple of different sectors from real estate to agricultural and, and different things going on. And each of those kinds of cooperative enterprises are gonna have slightly different things you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about as you think about money and finance. And uh, we can talk about the particulars of those along the way as well. Um, just to, Anna described shared capital a little bit and myself. So like she said, I've been working with co-ops for uh, gosh, almost 30 years now, <clears throat> yeah, most of that in uh, Chicagoland area, Wisconsin, Minnesota, but also working with a lot of national organizations in both developing and financing cooperatives around the country. Uh, Shared Capital Cooperative in particular, I've uh, been here for about eight years as a senior loan officer. Uh, we are a little bit unique in the world of financing. You know, we are a small business lender, but we only work with cooperatives. So in order to be eligible, your enterprise must be owned and operated on a cooperative basis. And we'll talk a little bit more later about what, how we interpret that and what that means. Uh, but uh, these days we have more than 300 members around the country. We're based up in the Twin Cities in, in Minnesota, but we've got staff in Seattle and New York and Tennessee and, and uh, New Mexico and all around the country. And we've got members everywhere from Hawaii to Alaska, and Florida to New York and in between. Um, we have a portfolio of about 100 borrowers right now. We are a fairly small fund. We only have about 23. We're bumping up against 24 million in assets. Um, but you'll notice about 40% of that comes from cooperatives. And so we are we were designed to be co-ops, uh, a, a way for co-ops to invest in other co-ops. And that has played out very well over the years. So we can make loans everywhere from, you know, 10,000, 20,000 on the small side to up above a million dollars on the larger size and can provide financing for almost any kind of small business need. Uh, everything from equipment and inventory to real estate and capital improvements along the way. So today um, we wanna to talk about kind of how loan decisions are made and really how to prepare yourself for a loan application. Um, and these things really apply to both loans but also to other kinds of investments that you might be looking for, depending on what you need for your business. Um, so that's the thing. There's a lot of things we're going to unpack within these questions, um, but that's where we want to spend our time today. And I'll, uh, I tried to put a few uh, pictures of some of our members and our borrowers, and I can uh, touch base and describe them along the way. Here we've got an older photo from the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. They are an active partner of ours that are a network of co-ops. So they are a co-op of co-ops, similar to us, uh, but their membership is Black-owned farmer co-ops everywhere, all across the South, from Texas to Florida. And they've been doing phenomenal work for uh, more than 50 years now in helping uh, Black farmers uh, get the resources they need and support they need and advocacy they need for, uh, for, their, for their farms and their businesses. Just a few numbers that I want you to think about here as we uh, get into crunching things. So there'll be a little quiz later on. Just memorize this. It won't be a problem. We'll get it all figured out and unpacked. Um, yeah, it's a joke, but I, I, I realize that a lot of people, uh, when it comes to looking at numbers and spreadsheets and thinking about these things, it starts to look like this pretty easily and get confusing. Um, I will highlight that I don't think I have any real numbers in this presentation. And so what I wanna talk about is how these things come together. We can talk about spreadsheets if we want to, but we're not gonna focus on that. We're not gonna worry about math today so much. 
we're going to talk about kind of the politics and structure and philosophy and ways that we think about money in our organizations along the way. I would actually love to start out hearing a little bit from you um, because we're talking about money, we're talking about credit and debt and those kinds of things. And we all have slightly different experiences uh, throughout our lives in our relationship to money. And so if people wouldn't mind sharing a little bit, I would love to hear your own stories, your own experiences of maybe your earliest memory of money as a child in your family, and maybe experiences as you grew up and your different ways that you interact with banks or lenders or credit, different points in your life, maybe going to school, maybe getting a job, maybe buying a car, those kinds of things. Because um, I want to sort of set the stage here of ways that people relate to money and thinking about how we can improve that relationship as we build our cooperatives. Um, so would anybody mind uh, stepping up and share, you know, take a few minutes to think about what you might want to share? Um, but if you I'd really appreciate it, folks would share some personal stories about how, they, how they've experienced money and credit throughout their lives. Well, I guess I can go. Um, first, just honestly, not having financial illiteracy, um, <laughs> I didn't understand, you know, the purpose of the thing. And so I guess it's a, it's inevitable to abuse it, you know, without knowing how to use it properly, you know, what its purposes are for specifically when and how and with who or not. So um, just a very personal um, story to myself. I was probably like, I don't know, 18, 19. And I just had to have a, in Atlanta, in Georgia, we had a store called Riches which I think it was like Riches and Macy's or something that combined department store. And so I was, you know, fashionista and I had to get my, my, my stuff. My, <laughs> and they were offering me a card and my dad kept saying, no, don't do it. I, 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 I don't even why, no, I, why I even told them that I was going to do it, but I let them know. And they did say, no, don't do it. But no one gave me the answer to why, why, why not? Why can't I do this and how to do it? And so what I learned was that no one really knew to be able to tell me why not. They just knew that that was not the best thing to do without the understanding. And so I charged it up, maxed it out, did everything I wanted to do. And then, you know, when the bill came, I was like, what is this? You know, I don't, I don't know what the deal is with this. So, <clears throat> you know, it was probably, I don't know, two fifty, three hundred dollars but still the principle has was then and still is the same now, you know, with understanding um, why, you know, I would do certain things, go into debt or take out a loan or, you know, versus buy something outright, you know, what is the real goal? So I would just sum it all up from my personal experience in just having the financial literacy to understand, you know, what moves to make when and why. Great, thank you. Anyone else? I can go next if that's all right. Yeah. Can you hear me? I guess my earliest memory in this context would be um, um, trying to open up, not trying to, we did open a small business. A childhood friend of mine and I um, opened a coffee shop in our community of which we were born and raised. And when it got time to look at the finances and apply for loans and things of that nature. Um, at the time, it was Provident Bank, which one, which was one of the largest banks in Baltimore um, a few years ago, close to a decade ago. Um, and so they were starting, they started, the loan officer started um, throwing out these numbers and what it would take to um, get approved for the loan. And I mean, it just sounded like it was nothing like I heard before. And so um, we had a, a few great folks that sat alongside us as we were trying to uh, open up this small business to largely encourage the community. Um, and we were so um, focused and um, 
driven by this building inside of the community narrative that we didn't think about um, the starting the new business. I mean, the money that it take, would take to start the new business. And so um, we was quite shocked at, um, you know, statements such as you may have to pitch your home up for collateral and things of this nature. And we were just blown away by that. It was um, daunting to say the least, but uh, my question is, how important is the budget versus the narrative? How important is the financial literacy piece versus the emotional literacy piece? And so hopefully we can get to that um, at some point today. And by the way, it was a good, the ending was we had opportunity to open the business. We got a small loan from a patron, what we call the patron saint. It was a member of um, a sister church of ours, and they were um, willing to pick up the seed money to get the equipment and to start the payroll. And so we didn't go the traditional route, um, but um, we lucked up that way. And we lasted four years um, and ultimately had to close the doors because we were hemorrhaging so much money um, monthly. And so, um, but we did get a chance to um, fulfill our childhood dream of opening a business in our community and become rock stars, you know? Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to share some personal experiences? I'll go. Um... Uh, again, my name is Rodney. Um, early experiences, early memories of money, um, uh, piggy banks and um, uh, passbook savings accounts that I remember my mother, uh, I have an older brother that we that we opened. And so my brother and I sold candy and raked pine straw and sold it and cut grass. So we had, you know, that that kind of thing going um it's interesting so in one sense uh i remember my father uh grew up very poor and um and i don't think he liked any reminders of poverty so so if it was anything like saving money or or clipping coupons or uh uh, anything that he associated with his childhood experience, you know, he just was very negative towards it. My mother, on the other hand, um, to me, she handled uh, most of the, the financial decisions. Obviously, they talked to one another, but she was the one that was calculating everything and figure everything out. And she would go to my father and say, let's do this. My father would say, OK. So uh, that's kind of warped me for life because... Uh, that's kind of been what my expectation of real life was that I've learned over the years is, is not really that, but, um, you know, just dealing with banks on, uh, uh, you know, buying mortgage, mortgage side, um, car financing, I've done businesses. Unfortunately, I have probably have bootstrapped every single one that I've done. And, uh, and so hope to do things differently. And, uh, so in, in some ways, I guess I am uh, trying to relive my childhood. My partner, Jamie, who is uh, on the Zoom. So she has, uh, I, I admire her for her work with uh, finances and business and, and real estate. So uh, I am looking to her and uh, my other colleague, Yvette, the tell me what to do and I'm going to do what they tell me to do <laughs> when it comes to this part of the, of the, the approach. And we're looking at doing um, real, real estate projects with uh, either a co-op uh, formation or a minimum integrating uh, co-op principles into our, uh, into our business model. Great. Thank you. Jamie, are you okay with that role that you've been assigned by Rodney? Yes, for as much as I can, you know, be that what he 
what he sees me as. <laughs> um, but just a little bit about me, I think um, growing up, I just remember not really having a lot of money and not talking really uh, about money. And what stands out to me most is I think that when you just, when you teach people some of the basic principles of money, um, it really, really helps because I remember being a little girl and having very, you know, childlike views of things and just wanting to grow up and be a rich woman with diamonds and furs and, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. And now as an adult who's had a lot of experiences, um, I think that if you allow, if you teach people that when you're looking at someone, you don't know what you're seeing, you know, what, what's really beneath the surface and what it takes to live a life that looks this way, to live a life that looks that way. And, you know, the different financial principles that people are using or not using or abusing, you know, to, to, to get where they are and to live, you know, their life. And um, so I think people need to understand that um, you get to decide what type of life you want to live and then you need to put those principles to work you know to do that and that of course everything that glitters is not gold so you know um but yeah that's that's pretty much it I think it's very important for people to understand the basic principles of money they do not change um and if you you know put them to work um uh, you can make it work for you and not against you Thank you. Um, let's see. Anyone at Wendell, you care to share? Don't feel like you have to. Oh, you're you're muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> Rodney kind of jogged my memory when he talked about passport savings. You know. <laughs> That brings back memories of, you know, my younger days, uh, you know, like him, you know, I was cutting grass, uh, delivering papers and, you know, doing little odd things and encouraged by my parents to, uh, you know, save something, don't spend everything. Uh, but yeah, uh, pretty much my experience with lending institutions has more to do with real estate, you know, buying a home. And then uh, I invested in real estate for uh, a number of years. So, you know, I had some um, commercial loans with uh, different companies and also learned a little bit about um, uh, sort of like creative financing, you know. And so, uh, you know, entered into a few deals with some owners uh you know and owner financing which i found uh you know very conducive uh for me at least uh in uh real estate investment uh yeah so and, and then and then of course you know financing cars uh you know over the years so uh yeah that's that that's been the uh extent and now my interest is really uh, how to get a viable business uh, started and off the ground and uh, sustainable and successful uh, with a minimum amount of debt. Thanks. Let's see. That, that's not everybody yet. Let's see who we got left. I could go. Okay, thanks. I haven't gone yet. Um, so my earliest memories of money would be like having a piggy bank when I was younger and not really remembering what happened to the money. Because <laughs> um, when I was younger, my parents usually controlled my money. But um, when I finally started to have control of my own money was when I went to college and opened a bank account. 
which was cool. Um, I was very fortunate that I was a college student because um, I didn't have overdraft fees. Um, I didn't really have to worry about a minimum in my bank account, um, which was very helpful being a college student. Um, and then uh, when I went to grad school, that's when I took out a student loan um, that I'm still paying off and has increased exponentially. And that's just taught me how lenders, even if it's the US government, can be very predatory. Um, and like as a student, I think just getting a higher education, the best lender I could have was the government instead of using a private loan. But even still, um, it's put me in a bad situation financially. So um, it's taught me just to be a little more mindful when it comes to um, like be more aware of the interest rates, um, how long, and those kind of things. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, we can, uh, I mean, I, there's, I think oh, people brought out a variety of points, I think, which are really important. We've got kind of the fundamentals of literacy, just knowing how the systems and structures work and how money and credit works. But we've also got layers of politics and class and race that sort of like, how does it actually play out? You know, there's there's the way it's supposed to work and then there, there's the way it really works. And I think that's some of what I want to unpack as we're going through our workshop today is is figuring out how do we, how do we, this is a relationship between you and someone else who has a resource that you need. It's a tool, you want, you need access to that tool or resource for what you want to accomplish. And there is a relationship you're gonna, you're gonna have to build there. Um, and unfortunately, many times it's an abusive relationship. And so how do we avoid that? How do we make sure that this is a healthy relationship and that it's that everybody's getting what they need out of that? Um, oh, to back up, that was uh, Red Emma's in, in Baltimore, um, which uh, Antoine, you may have come across already. That was their older site. We gave them a small loan to do some expansion a few years back. Um, and this is some folks at uh, Anytime Union Taxi. And uh, and uh, it's a driver-owned uh, taxi cooperative uh, in Montgomery County, in Maryland, as well. So, thinking about that relationship, because we're using cooperatives, <clears throat> um, we in a, in a shared capital, how we approach it is we want to use the cooperative principles um, because those principles were designed to create healthy relationships, hopefully, between a group of people to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And so if we're going outside for money, for resources, for credit, uh, for investments, we want to make sure that we're using those same principles uh, so that we don't damage the structure of our cooperative along the way. And so at the baseline, uh, we think that cooperative, that any capital that you raise, any cash or, or resources you raise should fundamentally not impair or, or, or undermine the cooperative structure. And kind of the baseline of that for us is the members of the cooperative and the cooperative needs to be in control of this relationship. Um, it's, uh, and we can unpack some more of that later, uh, but that's where we're starting from, is if we're looking for investments, we can't have those investments harm what we have set up as a better way to do business. And there's a few ways we can look at that. Um, and we're using, for shorthand, we're using the principles of cooperatives, kind of the seven or eight or 10 principles, depending on how you break those down. And a handful of them really do apply fairly directly and sometimes indirectly to this uh, thinking about bringing in money and bringing in investments. Um, similar to what I was just talking about, you have the principle of democratic member control. Uh, so we want those members to maintain control and we want that to be a democratic structure that we're using. 
Um, we want members to participate economically in our cooperatives. There's a lot of different ways that can happen. The, the most common and, and basic way is by purchasing a share. Um, that share could be uh, mostly symbolic. It could be a few dollars. It could be 20, 50, 100 bucks, whatever people can afford. Um, or it could be more substantial in that you might, in some cases, turn to your members for investments and loans and, and equity. And you might raise a larger amount of money from your membership if that's something that's available uh, to your cooperative and, among, and is available among your membership. Um, but at some level, whether it's a very small, modest level or, or a more substantial level, we want the members to participate in the economic needs of the cooperative. Um, again, coming back to that control question, uh, we want the cooperative to be autonomous and independent uh, in any relationship with other entities, be they contracts, uh, financial, uh, raising finances or other. And we like to prioritize cooperation among cooperatives. So whenever possible, let's work with other cooperatives to find the resources we need, because there should then be a baseline of understanding around all of these politics and dynamics. And, you know, a little advertisement here, shared capital actually is that, pra that principle in practice. So as I said, a significant amount of our, our dollars come from cooperatives that are investing in us. This is a picture of Proof Bakery in California. It's a, a bakery in Los Angeles that converted to worker ownership about a year and a half ago. And so they were a sole proprietorship. The woman who started it wanted to move on and we helped to finance uh, the workers organizing and purchasing it from the selling owner. So maybe starting with, let's start with what your co-op needs. So why are we looking for a loan or for financing? There's a lot of different things that you might need money for. Um, everything from just planning and figuring stuff out at the beginning uh, to, as, as I just talked about before, potentially purchasing a business or acquiring a business uh, for big expansions. Each of these different kinds of uses might turn to a slightly different kind of money to accomplish those things. And each of these different kinds of uses may be more or less important depending on what phase of growth or startup your business is in. So if you are starting from scratch, um, you're probably gonna need some resources for planning and feasibility. You're probably gonna need some working capital to really just keep the lights on as you get your business off the ground. If you're renting a space, you might need to do some improvements to that space uh, to make sure it functions for you. You might need to buy some inventory. Later, as your business is up and running a little bit, maybe you see some growth opportunities. Then you might need to buy more inventory, or maybe you need to buy some vehicles to uh, bring some more efficiency to your business, or some equipment to expand and produce some of your own products yourselves. And hopefully, if you continue to grow, uh, you'll reach the stage where uh, you don't want to rent anymore, and you want to give yourself a permanent home and then you need to buy some real estate. So these, these are very common uses uh, for, for funds and financing within the world of co-ops and most any small business. Um, and like I said, they're gonna come in slightly different forms uh, from slightly different places along the way. But there is a, a, um, a, to oversimplify a little bit, but mostly accurate, there are kind of two buckets of money that we're generally turning to. Um, we can turn to different forms of equity and different forms of debt. And there are some things that sit in between. There are some things that are not quite either of those that are out there. But most commonly, you're going to be looking for a loan or you're going to be looking for some kind of investment um, or grant or, or, or capital opportunity that will come your way. At the at Ultimately, debt financing is that loan you're essentially borrowing someone else's money and you're paying them kind of rent on that money and slowly getting it back to them. The lender doesn't actually own a piece of the business. Um, they're just lending you their money. Um, but they, they, you set up a, a fixed structure of payments 
so that they know when they're getting their money back and you can more easily predict when you're paying them over a certain period of time. Um, as uh, a few folks mentioned in your, your experiences, uh, there is sometimes collateral required in a loan or commonly collateral required in a loan. So that's important to figure out what is available if that's needed. Um, and if you are putting up collateral, you need to make sure you understand what the risk is involved there and what the lender's <clears throat> opportunities are to ever claim that in a worst case scenario. On the other side of the, of the page, we've got this equity. So this is really um, people either purchasing shares or making another form of investment in your co-op. And uh, without any uh, necessarily any fixed payments earlier on, um, but, uh, and so it gives you more flexibility, it gives you more cushion, more breathing room as you get started. You're not having to make monthly payments back to that investor right away. Um, but typically you are giving up some piece of ownership or control in your business. And this is where we want to be very careful as a cooperative of, are we actually giving up control? If we are, what does that look like? So they are taking a higher risk with you because they don't have a structured payback uh, plan. They only get paid back if you're profitable. So they want you to be profitable, which is why they often want to take some ownership to kind of step in and force the better decisions, at least what they think are better decisions. You may not. Um, but they, uh, their return is based on your return and your success or failure along the way. They, if you profit, they profit. If you lose money, they lose money. Um, and so these different kinds of equity and debt and debt, like I said, can take fairly slightly different structures and look slightly different depending on who you're working with. Um, and this is kind of some uh, the most common kind of types of, of debt and equity you're going to turn to along the way. On the right hand side, we've got senior and subordinate loans. Um, the difference between those two is, of course, who has a first claim on collateral or a first claim on your cash flow to make sure that you get those payments in every month that you've committed to making. Um, most commonly, people are going to want to have a senior loan because that gives them a priority position in, in payments uh, if things are struggling along the way. Uh, subordinate loans are not always readily available because they're taking a little bit more risk. Um, they're structured as a loan still, same kind of uh, relationship, but they're willing to take to sit behind that other lender and and wait until that other lender gets repaid sometimes before they can get repaid. In the middle and on the left hand side, we've got preferred stock and common stock. Really, common stock is really just another way of describing the money that your members have invested when they purchase that share to become a member. And again, that may be a very small portion of your actual funds, um, or it may be larger if your members have the wherewithal and the resources to bring that cash to the table. Preferred stock is, uh, is real equity. They're purchasing preferred stock shares in your company. They are getting a return based on your success. Um, but it's called preferred because um, in a worker co-op uh, and, and other forms of cooperatives, the members get a return on their participation in the co-op. So if you're a worker co-op, the more hours you work, the more access you have to patronage dividends. So the, the co-op does well, you get paid back based on how many hours you worked. If you're a farmer's cooperative and the co-op does well, you get paid back based on the amount of, of uh, material you've brought to the co-op or the, the level of participation you've had. Um, but if the co-op is profitable at the end of the year, you can't pay out to your members until you've paid out to your preferred stockholders. So they do have a priority in access to those profits, um, but they only get a portion of it. You can still pay yourselves and you have to decide each year, if you're profitable, um, how much you want to allocate towards uh, paying out dividends to investors and paying out dividends to your members based on their patronage or their participation in the cooperative. And then on the far hand, left hand side, these are not <laughs> things that are not always available to businesses and cooperatives, but um, we see a little bit more activity these days than we have in the past from foundations, 
and other community organizations that are interested in supporting uh, cooperative development in their communities and just straight up making grants and donations um, or turning to crowdfunding sources and online platforms to raise money as well. That's the best kind of money to have because there's no strings attached. Typically, there's no return demanded by those investors. It's cash for you to use to get your business up and growing or expanding. There's a, a bunch of stuff on that page, and I'll dig in a little bit further into the sources of those things, but want to pause to see if there's questions or thoughts about that. Not seeing any, we will move on because this is a breakdown of, so slid those up a little bit, of where do we find this money? Um, so I talked about members a few times and that members are, you know, the, the baseline is them purchasing their common stock, but co-ops at different times may turn to their members for subordinate loans or preferred stock investments or grants and donations from their members as well. Um, so the membership is often the first place you turn to to say, you know, what have people got? What can they afford to invest? They may or may not have that, um, but that's usually the first place you turn. Um, the second place that's often turned to um, is, uh, well, actually further down there would be the crowdfunding. Uh, because people are looking to their community around them to say, who in, the, who in our community wants to invest? And again, that could take the form of grants and donations or purchasing of actually preferred stock more than common stock, since they won't be members, really. That's a little error in the slide, I guess I need to correct. But, um, jump in, and then above that, just kind of moving around here a little bit, other cooperatives, as I mentioned before, co-ops investing in co-ops is a fairly common thing. Um, whether they do that through a structure like shared capital um, or whether they do that directly. And so we quite often see cooperatives that have been successful that want to support other co-ops in their community and are willing to make, again, uh, stock investments, subordinate debt, or other grants and donations to a new co-op that's starting up or, or growing in their community. The CDFI and mission-based loan funds, I've got a little bit more information on that. Um, are people familiar with the, 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 the acronym CDFI? <coughs> so it uh, really stands for uh, community development financial institutions. And these are essentially um, a, it's really a designation by the federal government for mission minded lenders and investors. Uh, there are CDFIs all across the country. There are very large ones that work nationally. Um, there are very small ones that focus in different neighborhoods. Some of them focus exclusively on affordable housing or community facilities for nonprofits. And some of them focus on small business uh, lending and investing. Um, they are often a first tier of lenders and, and more formal lenders and investors into cooperatives because they, uh, they are more likely to understand your mission and your purpose as a cooperative in your community. Banks and credit unions um, occasionally will lend to cooperatives, um, not as often to startups or smaller co-ops. And um, we'll talk more later about the nuances of how they structure those loans and investments um, that may be more uh, restrictive or more conservative and may not always provide what you need. Um, and so, but they are, they can be available. Um, and, and there it's very much about finding the right person at the bank or the credit union who's willing to understand what you've got going on. I have a question, Mr. Frick. Yeah. Is the CDFI similar to the CDBG, Community Development Block Grants? Uh, CDBG is typically flowing through a public entity like a municipality, a city, a county, or a state entity. And so they use those dollars to invest in community development. Um, there are usually programs established at those government levels to say, this is what we're going to do with our CDBG dollars. Um, but they are, they are different and separate from CDFI, whereas CDFIs are normally independent, uh, either nonprofit or for-profit private entities 
that are making loans and investments. So they sit outside of the government structure. Oh, okay. Um, but there can be times when a CDFI is making a loan to a business and they are also accessing CDBG dollars from their local government that, that if they happen to fit within the priorities of the local government's use of those dollars. Um, um, I, yeah. I have a question. Yep. Are there CDFIs that prioritize funding to black owned businesses? There are some, and that's uh there have been a there are a growing number of CDFIs that have sort of acknowledged the lack of access to financing from black owned businesses and black owned enterprises. And there are a, a lot of CDFIs that prioritize investments and loans to uh, black owned enterprises. Um, but there, and there are very few that exclusively work in those spaces. Um, but there are uh, most CDFIs, um, unfortunately not all, but most CDFIs uh, tend to prioritize uh, Black and, and BIPOC-owned businesses and enterprises. Okay, by tend, do you mean like it's in their bylaws or you, it's just something that you notice? It usually, it may not necessarily be in the bylaws, but it might be in their kind of strategic priorities and their programming priorities. Are, and, these, are these CDFIs that you'll share in your presentation? I can share. So I have a list of some that are, um, let me see if that slide is coming up soon here. Yeah, actually, these, these this is a list of the CDFIs that are most active today in lending to cooperatives in general. And I think all of these CDFIs have a programmatic and a strategic priority to invest and support Black-owned businesses. Um, but each of these will work with uh, like all different kinds of cooperatives. Uh, but, uh, but I think everybody on this list has a strategic priority within their programming to support Black-owned enterprises. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, in the world of CDFIs, so there are, a thousand CDFIs around the country, um, there are only a fraction of them that really understand cooperatives and the dynamics of a cooperative ownership model and how to tweak and adjust investments to make sure it respects the cooperative structure. So unfortunately, of from all of those CDFIs around the country, these are the folks that do it most often. And there are maybe uh, twice as many of these that occasionally be, will, will be working with cooperatives, but may, may not make, make it a part of their core identity. Uh, but the folks on this list really uh, elevate either work exclusively like ourselves with cooperatives or have a significant part of their portfolio focusing on cooperatives. Um, Shared Capital and LEAF are both national organizations. We both, we actually work together with all of these groups quite often. <coughs> Capital Impact Partners is national, but they have some priority geographies they work in. Um, Cooperative Fund of the Northeast, as their name implies, is primarily in New England, but they also work in, in New York State. Um, Seed Commons is kind of a network of small funds across the country. So they have, I don't, I'm not sure, maybe a dozen or 15 cities and regions around the country where they have local entities that work focus on those areas. Um, Fund for Jobs Worth Owning is a smaller niche group that mostly works with co conversions of co to cooperatives, or uh, they work primarily in certain sectors like uh, child care, health, uh, home care cooperatives, and a few other sectors they focus on. And then uh, Rochdale is actually kind of the newest CDFI in this space. They just launched this year. And so they're still kind of rolling out some of their priorities, but I think they're focusing on a few different geographies, um, and but they will, I think, ultimately be available nationally. Just stepping back one more time, see if there's any other questions around this. Um, oh, yeah, I see uh, Johan with CFNEs has been a presenter, yeah. Yeah, this is Rodney. Uh... Can you speak a little bit more about any experiences you've had with the connection between crowdfunding and preferred stock? So crowdfunding can take a couple of different forms. So it's 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 often sort of framed or or talked about as an investment when in fact it often ends up really just being a donation. 
So, you know, depending on what platform you're using, um, you might really just be getting donations and maybe offering kind of perks or, or, uh, or, or product or something like that as a gift back from back to people who, in, who have those donations. But there are some platforms like Kiva and things like that, where it is actually a small loan, uh, generally with fairly good terms, um, but they tend to be tend to be smaller dollar amounts. So a couple thousand dollars, maybe ten or twenty thousand dollars at most. And so those are those can be really good for uh, smaller dollar needs. Um, if you get to the point where you're buying real estate or you're you're buying major equipment or you're spending, you know, a million dollars or more on your project, you are probably going to tap crowdfunding less as a part of that and look for more larger traditional investors. Um, but, you know, yeah, so crowdfunding is really meant to be a an all encompassing of a handful of different ways that people turn to their communities for that. Um, and like I said, uh, it's a little bit of an error on the slide. It actually, if there, if crowdfunding is coming in as a formal investment, it's going to take the form of purchasing preferred stock or probably a subordinate loan of some sort. So would you consider, um, I guess, models such as uh, 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 neighborhood real estate investment trust or means by which um, uh, uh, individuals can purchase stock, is that more in the impact investor lane uh, on, on your slide? Yeah, I think you're, what you're touching on is, is, is sort of an evolving space where people are turning to their communities to buy shares and their kind of real estate investment groups. Um, and I think for the most part, if we're working with a group that is also doing that, we would interpret most of those investments as stock purchases and equity investments. Um, unless they were formally set up as loans, um, are how we would ex with it's sort of the stack of capital in an organization. We would look at those as equity investments. Thank you. Yeah, when I, the impact investor box. I'm really typically talking about more formal mission-based investment organizations, RSF social finance, social impact groups, things like that. Um, that are maybe doing slightly larger investments. If I can, on that point, um, is, is is the social impact investing field uh, growing? Is it is it stagnant? What's what's your sense of you know? For a while, there's a lot of work, uh, you know, a lot of institutions or organizations trying to do. Uh, social impact investing. What's your what's your take on it now, especially as it relates to uh, co-ops? I would say that as it's as I understand it, the the field continues to grow steadily, but unfortunately, their understanding of co-ops is still fairly limited. When you look at the entire field of social impact investors, uh, they're mostly looking at more traditional models of business ownership. Um, but we spend time in those spaces, or the people in my office spend time in those spaces, trying to educate folks on that. And we, whenever possible, we do try to bring those folks in to, to projects that we're working on and businesses we're working with. One way that they can get comfortable with something like that sometimes initially is by investing in a group like ours. And then we turn around and make a loan to a co-op. And so they don't, they just have to understand the strength of our business. And then we kind of translate to, to working directly with the co-op. Other questions or comments? I do have a question that may I ask? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how to frame it, but uh, in terms of natural disasters, how, um, I don't know what I'm trying to ask here. Does any of these funding opportunities tend to take a back seat when it comes to um, natural disasters or things of that nature? Um, let's see, make sure I understand your question. So are you describing a situation where maybe one of these groups has made an investment or a loan and a natural disaster affects the business and, and causes it to struggle? And how do they relate? I know in terms of priorities with these um, 
funding opportunities. I mean, what do you call them? The um, come back to me. I think that um, need to get my words together here. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, and I, I I will say that um, kind of responding to natural disaster situations. I think most of the mission-based groups here, not all of them, but a lot of them would see that as a need that they can fill. Um, they may not have specific priorities about that per se, uh, but I think for the most part, like CDFIs, um, there are conversations in the industry about like, how do we be better prepared to react to, to uh, climate change issues, to hurricanes, to droughts, to those kinds of things. Uh, as things change. So I think people have an awareness of it. People would recognize the importance of supporting businesses in surviving those situations. Um, but I can't, uh, I'm not certain how many of them have a particular program or, or strategic uh, thing in their documents that says this is what we're specifically about. Okay, thank you. I have a question about uh, co-ops. Uh, investing in co-ops does that kind of come about or is it kind of fostered as a result of uh, traditional uh, finance um, institutions uh, not as willing to finance co-ops and you know the idea that we need to support our own quote unquote yeah, very much so. Um, and and that's, you know, the, the origins of shared capital 40 years ago, some co-ops in the upper Midwest were trying to get loans for their businesses and the banks didn't understand it, thought it was too much of a risk, weren't willing to do that. They came together and organized and said, we need to find co-op money just for co-ops to, to fill that gap and that need. Um, and then, so that's, yeah, it's very much a reaction to that. Um, and then there are, you know, it, it can play out in, in different ways. It can play out in ways like shared capital is structured. Um, it can also play out in somewhat unique particulars depending on a local market. So we've had uh, groups we work with where a group in many years ago, a group in Austin, Texas was starting up a small bakery business. Um, and there was a co-op grocery store that knew they wanted to sell the products of that bakery and support it. So they made a small loan to that business directly. There was also a housing co-op that knew that their students, uh, it was a student housing co-op, would be interested in having that product available uh, in the community as well. And so they made a direct loan into that. Um, and then there was another co-op that was another bakery co-op in another part of the country that was successful. And they said, hey, we wanna help them get going. They made a guarantee to us so we can make a larger loan than we otherwise would have um, to get that co-op off the ground. And so there's a lot of different ways, either directly or indirectly, that co-ops can invest in other co-ops. Right. Any other thoughts on these? I will say at the, the on the bottom, the public subsidy uh, thing, um, there are folks within uh, the worker co-op world and other parts of the co-op world that are like, we want to be independent. We won't. We don't have, want to have to rely on the government for what we're doing. That's a legitimate philosophy and approach. Uh, but my my approach is generally as long as as long as Walmart is tapping public subsidies to keep their doors open, we should be using those same dollars for our businesses. And when they stop, we will stop. So that's kind of been my approach. I encourage folks to really seek out what their options might be uh, from local government in different ways. Uh, but I can appreciate folks that want to stay out of that and stay kind of politically independent as well. Let's see. here. So already touched on this slide um, and we can come back to more about those organizations if people want. I apologize. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't want you to get too far. I'll raise my hand next time in the chat. It's okay. Uh, since you made that point there, how do we find out more and more about which of these large corporations are receiving governmental assistance and our taxpayer dollars? How do where's that information? <laughs> you know, since you said it, I, you know that would be something good to to forecast and to 
to have more understanding about. Yeah. Oh, I, thank you, yeah. Rodney. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Rodney said all of them do. So, I mean, oh, it yeah. makes sense, though. It, I mean, it makes perfect sense. And that's what I'm saying. I, I want to learn more about it. How? Where is it at? Where's that info? Yeah, I am not an expert on sort of tracking those things down, but I know there are a, a number of kind of tax policy advocacy groups around the country that do that kind of tracking um, and community development organizations that will do some of that tracking. Um, I'll see if I can hunt down some of those groups and, and send them to you afterwards, um, but I'm not an expert on that side. Um, but And there, al there also is this idea of there are direct public subsidies occasionally in the form of, well, we want to attract a new industry to town, so we're going to give them tax breaks and we're going to give them free land and the city's going to pay for the, the plumbing and the, the streets and everything out to their business. Um, that's a fairly direct form of supporting large corporate uh, development in, in a community. But there is also, and kind of maybe even more so when, I, when we mentioned things like Walmart, there are these indirect approaches as well where Walmart doesn't play, pay its employees mm -hmm. enough, and so they have to turn to food stamps and, and child support and other things that if they were paid better, they wouldn't need to tap government programs uh, to just to keep their home going. Uh, so there is both, I would say, that if you're doing that kind of research, looking at both direct and indirect uh, reliance on on the public goods to support private corporations. Thank you. Let's see. So, OK, so this coming back to that other slide I had before. So we, you know, kind of identifying what we need. Then it's about matching it up with uh, both those sources and what form will it take this investment into our cooperative. Um, so if you're looking for things like planning, feasibility, working capital, leasehold improvements, things that have no kind of tangible value per se, something that you couldn't offer as collateral or that couldn't be resold to be used to pay down debt, um, you're usually looking at uh, either sort of generously structured loans uh, that are short term or, ec or real equity investments. And occasionally you might be looking for lines of credit that revolve over time. So if you have a seasonality to your business, you might need to draw down money in the spring uh, to plant your crops and pay it back in the fall when you've, when you've sold your product and you have cash to, to cover that. So a lot of agricultural financing, of course, uh, follows those cyclical natures as well. If you're looking for inventory or vehicles or equipment purchases, you may have a short to midterm loan that is very much tied to the life of that collateral. So if your inventory is, is, uh, is widgets and those widgets aren't, aren't gonna deteriorate and they have value, um, it might be easier to get financing. If your inventory is loaves of bread and eggs and milk, um, that stuff will drop in value pretty quickly once it sits on the shelf for a while. It might be harder to, to finance some of that, uh, connecting it to the, to the collateral life, but it, it can be financed, but it might be a little bit harder. And then once you start to talk about real estate or purchasing an existing business, um, then you may have moderate to longer term mortgage that you're using um, and those mortgage loans are going to be structured a little bit differently than the shorter term loans for vehicles or inventory, things like that. Or you may have a short term construction loan if you need to build out your space and or, uh, do capital improvements on your building. Um, and then business acquisition and conversion is kind of a unique space, but it is a growing space in the United States where retiring business owners are selling their businesses to their employees instead of selling it to a competitor or shutting it down. And those uh, transactions usually have a combination of equity and debt that is ultimately tied to the cash flow of the business and relying on that to repay. This again is a fairly high level look. Each of those, box, those boxes on the right hand side kind of have some nuances and uh, within them, different variations on how those loans might be structured but it's kind of a broad stroke to give you a sense of um, a lo every loan is a little bit different from every other loan. 
and how it's being used and how it's structured is important. Take a moment to breathe here. We talked about a lot of stuff there. We did kind of take a little pause so we can, we could either take like a, a more formal kind of 10 minute break here, or we can keep on going. I'll leave that up with folks. Uh, we're going to dig into the real underwriting and the questions of why do lenders and investors ask us all these questions and, and what are they thinking? Um, would folks still like to officially kind of shut down for five or 10 minutes or do we want to keep going? Keep going is my vote. Okay. If anybody, if anybody right. break, feel free to step away. Thank you. So yeah, so we want to talk about these lenders and investors. They all come with their own context, their own assumptions and stereotypes and, and willingness or unwillingness to do certain things. Um, and ultimately, from the investor and the lender side of things, we're talking about their risk analysis. They want to know how likely is it for them to get their money back. Um, and they will use different formulas, different analysis to figure out what their risk is along the way. And that risk, their willingness to take on that risk is driven by a variety of different motivations. And, and depending on who they are, where their money comes from, where they fit within the local politics, um, are they regulated or unregulated? What kind of industry standards are they looking for? And like CDFIs, what are their mission priorities along the way? As you might imagine, a small business, a small bank, even a, or a large bank or even a small community bank, a lot of their decision making is driven by regulation and what the, the government says they have to do in order to make good loans and what they have to do to keep their portfolio healthy. Um, there are times when when banks, uh, large and small, may give you regulation as an excuse for not being able to do something. It is an excuse, um, and sometimes it's legitimate, and sometimes it's not. Um, it's an easy excuse to rely on, because it is true. If they make loans that fall outside of their normal purview, and their normal credit analysis, and the federal regulators come in and do, review their, do an audit, they're gonna get a big red flag for certain loans that fall outside of the norm. Um, the, the question there is often then, why is the regulation structured that way? So, so sometimes it is a legitimate excuse. The bank's like, I wish I could do this, but I can't because I'll get uh, penalized by the regulators. Um, and sometimes they're just kind of passing the buck along. Um, and there are occasions when banks can step a little bit outside of that. Um, but it can depend on, again, the ownership of the bank, the relationship that the bank has with the kind of work that you're doing, and some of the priorities. Um, banks and credit unions are, reg are both regulated <laughs> in slightly different ways. Credit unions do have um, a little bit more flexibility in some of the investing and lending that they do. But credit unions, for the most part, are not established to be commercial or business lenders. They are typically, most often, credit unions are established to be consumer lenders. So they are going to work with individuals and individual households on savings accounts and personal loans and things like that. Um, but they, they typically have less experience and less capacity to make a true business loan or a commercial loan to a business. And so in those cases, you may want to better understand, is the credit union in my community a consumer lender? Or is, does it have a commercial lending program that you might be able to work with? People, of course, talk about, again, it's there's truth to it, and sometimes it's packing, passing the buck, but just the, the broad concept of redlining. Um, we often initially blame the banks, and it is true, the banks were, were performing based on redlining approaches, um, but the banks were using rules that the federal government set up. So federal redlining was was a was a, a, a system that was established by the federal government, and the banks just followed it 
again, the banks have big influence on how the federal government sets up its regulations. So they are not innocent of the crimes of redlining. Um, but there is this rich relationship between the banks and the regulators um, that is a large issue for policy work and advocacy work that some progress has been made on, but there's a long ways to go. So how do lenders assess that risk? <clears throat> Why do they ask all these questions? What are they really looking for? Um, you may have heard of these things called the seas of credit. Uh, there's different versions of it out there, uh, but fundamentally the things that banks should be and are typically looking at fall into these categories of cash flow, collateral, capacity, conditions, and character. And I'll, we'll spend a little time digging into each of those. But in the world of cooperatives, there are a handful of unique ones as well. And if you're a lender or investor knows what they're doing and understands the co-op model, they're going to dig into those things as well along the way. Um, folks here in the picture is a co-op here in, in Minnesota, just down the road from where I live, called Agua Gorda. It's a Latino farmer co-op uh, working outside of the Twin Cities, uh, mostly immigrant folks uh, farming in the region. Cash flow. So the first one on that list. This is pretty straightforward in that you've got to pay your loan back. And so how do you pay it back? You pay it back by making money. Um, you've got your revenue, the money coming in. You subtract out all of your operating expenses and all of your labor expenses to pay yourselves. What's left has to be enough to pay back your lenders. And so your debt service, the monthly amount that you pay back to your lenders, uh, needs to be a little bit more, or I'm sorry, a little bit less than what the cash you actually have. And there is this ratio called the debt service coverage ratio that you may hear about, or just debt service coverage. And different lenders have a, uh, often a slightly different number that they, they will look for as a minimum. And they might throw out a number like a 1.2 or a 1.4 debt service coverage ratio. What that means is, if we're looking at a 1.2, it means really in, in plain language, it means you have about 20% more than what you need to pay your loan back every month. So if your debt service every month is $100, they want to know that you, after your operating expenses, you have $120 left to make that $100 payment. Really what, the, what they're doing is they're looking for some cushion. We want to know that you have more than what you need because that allows for situations where you have a difficult month and suddenly you only make 100 instead of 120 and you can barely pay that back. Um, of course, if you only end up with $90 that month, you're, you're a negative debt coverage ratio. Um, but that 1.0 1 to 1.0 ratio would mean you have exactly what you need and anything above that is a slightly larger. 1.1 is 10% more, 1.2 is 20% more. Um, so we often, our, our kind of baseline is so we really like to see at least a 1.2. And that's a way of, again, making sure that there's some breathing room in there that allows you to have a good month or a bad month and still be able to make those payments. There may be times when they say, in addition to your projections and your, your budgets saying that you have a little bit more than what you need to cover the debt service, they may actually just go ahead and require that you put some money into an account and make your payments out of that account. Um, that makes them feel really comfortable because they know the cash is sitting there to make the payments. Um, but that can be a challenge for you because you've got to raise that extra money somewhere to put into that reserve to make them comfortable. Um, we typically do not require reserves. There are occasions when we may require a reserve, but it's typically not something we do but it is something that can be fairly common. Questions about that? Uh, folks here in the picture is Design Action Collective. They are a worker-owned design and print shop in uh, Oakland, California. And uh, we made a loan to them, gosh, maybe eight years ago, seven years ago to help expand their business and relocate, build out a new space. 
So the cash flow is the primary source. We want to know there's enough cash there to pay the loan back. The collateral or other forms of security is really the secondary source. What do we do if the cash flow is gone? And ultimately, uh, it shouldn't be that it's just, oh, we're short a month or two months, and then we'll get back on track. Really, we're only looking at collateral, where we only should be looking at collateral if things are just in very dire straits and it seems very unlikely that the business is going to be able to turn around. Um, so a workout scenario, worst case scenario, the business is probably shutting down. In that case, the lender is looking at that collateral as a way to recoup what they have invested in the business um, uh, before everything falls apart and there's nothing left. This may be equipment. It may be inventory. Like I said, it depends on the kind of inventory, depend depending on how they can value that. It might be real estate or vehicles or whatever you're buying the loan using to, the loan to buy. Um, there is here's another uh, term or ratio that you might then hear about. Uh, this the the value of that collateral is often defined in terms of a loan to value ratio or a coverage ratio. Those are kind of uh, two different ways of, of looking at the same number. Essentially here too, um, if we're making a loan for real estate, we want to know that our loan is only 70 or 80 or 90% of the value of that real estate. So if you're going to buy a million dollar property, our loan may max out at 700, 800, $900,000. So there's still some cash you have to come up with to purchase the rest of that property. And so if we are lending 700,000 on a million dollar property, we have a uh, we have a 70% loan to value on that property. Um, there's a few different reasons why the loan is going to be less than the value of what's being purchased. A lot of it has to do with the process of selling that collateral, of auctioning off equipment, of selling the vehicle, of the transaction costs of selling real estate are sort of built into that assumption so that we assume it's going to cost some money to collect. And so um, so we want to know that there's more value there than the debt that's, that's uh, available. Different lenders will have different thresholds for that. So we prefer to make, like, again, with real estate or even with vehicles or something, we prefer to be at 80% or so or 70% of the loan to value in that in those conditions. But there are many times when we make loans that have no collateral at all. There are times when we make loans where we're at 100% of the value of the collateral. And there's different ways, usually uh, mission priorities or other strategic priorities might, might lead to those decisions. So it is definitely possible. And especially in the case of we do a fair amount of working capital loans, meaning we're not buying equipment with this money. We're just paying salaries and paying the bills to keep the business going as they grow or as they get started off. There's no collateral there. So we're make, we're taking sort of full risk on that investment and we're really relying on that cash flow and the other elements, the ability of the co-op to be successful rather than assuming that we're going to be able to collect on any kind of collateral. There is this big question about guarantees. So I forget who mentioned it, but somebody uh, sort of discovering this thing about personal guarantees and putting your house up on the line for a business loan. That is standard practice in the world of business lending. Um, it is not standard practice in the world of cooperative lending. Um, some cooperative lenders still do turn to personal guarantees. We do not. And uh, most of the people on that page I shared before in the CDFI world do not rely on personal guarantees for our cooperative loans. This is where we are we are stepping outside of the norms of regulation and the norms of business to respect the cooperative structure. We don't think that the individuals should be put at risk for this collective endeavor. So we will place a lien on the business assets of the cooperative. If the co-op fails, we will collect those assets. But we we draw the line at so what they call piercing the corporate veil to get to the individuals and lay claim on your house, your car, whatever things you might have. Um, that that and as 
I'm sure many of you know, or many of you can assume that has been a part of predatory lending in the past is let's make you a loan that we think will probably fail anyway. And then we're going to take your house. We're going to take your farmland. We're going to take your vehicles um, and, and truly abusive lending out there. And so one way that we have shifted that dynamic to improve that relationship is to stop with the personal guarantees. We don't use personal credit scores when we assess a loan because we're underwriting the group of people and their ability to be productive and effective as a group. We're not relying on any, any individual one person. This can be a big hurdle for most any regulated lender and even some mission-based lenders that do fairly traditional small business financing. Um, it's really hard for them to understand why they need to give that up. And we do a lot of advocacy and education around that, but it's something that's important to understand. There are times when a cooperative may use a personal guarantee to get what they need because they think they don't have any other resources. It's unfortunate, but it is sometimes the case. <clears throat> Questions or thoughts about that? Yeah, I do have a question. So with everything you just stated, then that means um, your lending practices must be a fairly uh, more flexible and, and understanding to, like you were just saying, you know, startups and new co-ops, because if you're not uh, approving basing, based on, you know, any type of personal um, guarantee, then um, that means you guys understand exactly what's going on and that it has to begin with the business. And so you, you're flexible in that space a lot, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you're probably not surprised in how hard that is to get that message across to other lenders. Um, the, uh, the sort of abusive practice in there. I, and I think most lenders don't see it on the surface as an abusive practice. And, and in fact, part of it is that, um, it can, the logic of it can make a little more sense when you are working with a sole proprietorship. Here's one person who's starting a business. That one person is going to get all of the upside of success of that business. And so a lender says, well, if things fail, then that one person is going to suffer from the failure too. There is a logic for better or for worse that can apply to that situation. Um, so what we're doing is we're shifting that and saying it's not about an individual anymore. It's about this group of people. And we're so we're underwriting that group. So just as an extension of that approval for the group, then do you guys have um, some assurances and, and, and maybe some systems in place that void against the failure? To, to, so that way everybody's interest is protected, right? Because nobody goes into business with the intent on failing. Right. Yeah. And, and what we're doing is we are uh, spending more time on all of the other elements of underwriting. So collateral in the, in the spaces where it's not available, um, we're just going to assume, OK, well, this we're willing to take this risk without that collateral as a secondary source. So we're going to spend extra time and build extra assurances on the primary source, the cash flow. So that's why we may want to put extra cushions in there. So you've got breathing room to have some, make some mistakes, figure it out, get back on track, um, rather than uh, tapping those individuals for that. And the other elements that we'll, we'll, we'll talk on after this slide too, uh, we're going to spend more time on those spaces to feel, to strengthen those so that we can avoid that worst case scenario. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Sure. So you may have answered this, Mr. Frick, already, Fick, um, but what is your definition of skin in the game? <laughs> um, it's not my favorite term, but uh, the, we do. So here, too, um, kind of going back to that member economic participation uh, principle is we want people to have to we want people to bring what they can afford to bring to the table. Um, so if you have wealthier individuals in your group, we encourage them to bring some of their cash to the table. If you're a group of folks that have very few means and very few assets available to you, then we expect you to bring less. Um, and so the kind of, again, that baseline of member participation is purchasing that member share. People often ask us, well, how much should the share be? And I think that varies a lot depending on the membership and the type of enterprise that you're, you're developing. But my kind of, 
Short answer is it should be a meaningful amount. So it should be more than a cup of coffee. <clears throat> so you want people to, to like think about this when they're bringing their share value to the table and, and make it a serious investment from them. But from some people, $100 is a serious investment. And for some people, $10,000 is a serious investment. So I think it varies a lot depending on the group and what you're trying to accomplish. All right, thank you. Any other thoughts on that? Do you give a, a, a kind of a dividend value or a return value on uh, that membership uh, contribution? No, typically the member share in a co-op is a fixed value. So if it's a hundred dollar share, you, you pay a hundred dollars and you work there for 10 years and you leave, you get your hundred dollars back. Where the, where the benefits of being a member show up is in the patronage dividend. So every year you look at the profits of the company and you decide how much of those profits should stay with the co-op and how much of those profits should be passed through to the members. And so that's a, you know, usually it's a board or a finance committee that's making that decision. Sometimes it's all of the members coming together to make that decision. And so we discourage a return on the, the actual member share and really look to that patronage dividends, meaning uh, you get a dividend based on the amount of activity you've had with the co-op, being that hours that you've worked or products that you've brought to a processing co-op or something like that, um, rather than changing or, or, or paying out based on that share. Part of that is, uh, is part of the logic there is um, this really one person, one vote and, and sort of one member, one, one share is that if you have a group of people where some people have more assets and some people have few, um, we don't want a situation where one person is profiting more than another person because they came into the situation with more money as defined within that share. So, but so we, we, if, if people have more money and they want to invest it, we would encourage them to invest it in the form of a preferred share, just like any other outside investor or in the form of a loan to the co-op. Like again, like an outside lender might bring. Uh, I got you. Thank you. The, the place where that is different is in housing cooperatives where the value of the share will change over time, typically, not always, but commonly will change. There's a whole different uh, logic around share loan value within housing co-ops I'd be happy to talk about. That's kind of a whole other session. But if you're interested in talking more about that, I'd be happy to set up a time with you to talk about housing co-op shares. So with that, you're saying that the share could go, the price of the share could go up in time, you're saying? Within a housing cooperative, yes, yes. So that new members coming in may pay more than the initial members. Potentially, yes. And within the world of housing co-ops, there are a whole lot of variations on how people value that share. Um, people that are focused on uh, affordability as their target and they want permanent affordability may fix the value of that share and say it will always stay the same because we want people always to be able to move into this home ownership model uh, at a very low rate. Other housing co-ops may be focused on modest wealth creation for their households. That's great too. Um, and in those cases, the value of the share is going to increase with either the market or as the mortgage is paid down, that allows individuals to make a little bit of money off of the home that they've been living in and spending their money on. Um, but it does then, as you referenced, raise the price of that for the next generation of people to move in. So there's some some questions that the group has to answer for themselves around their priorities of affordability versus wealth creation for their members. But those are unique to housing co-ops typically. All other forms of cooperative ownership, the member share typically stays the same. Mm -hmm. Another, the next C in our list is capacity. And so this is, again, like, you know, if we don't have collateral or we don't have personal guarantees, we wanna really understand that you've got people with the ability to do what you wanna accomplish around the table. 
So if you have a management structure to your cooperative um, or even just the leadership that's there, whoever's doing the work to, to run this business, we want to understand, do you know what you're doing? Do you have experience in this? Um, are you learning it? Um, do you have the, the people that can help you figure those things out? Um, and do you have the right people in the right positions along the way to get the work done? There's also a kind of a financial capacity, which overlaps with some of the other analysis around cash flow and things. Um, but we want to know that the way that your business is managing its money, tracking its money, uh, making sure that all of the members have access to, to that information, that it's transparent, that you have reporting systems, um, things like that in place um, so that you can you can manage those dollars well as you uh, start your business and grow your business along the way. We do this analysis not so that we can, like a lot of these other lenses that we're using to assess the credit and the risk, um, we're digging in and asking some tough questions around capacity, not so that we can say no, but so that we can identify any gaps and then work with you to figure out how do we fill those gaps? Does it mean that we have to bring somebody else into the co-op who has particular experience? Can we turn to an outside consultant or technical assistance provider to bring that resource to what you need? Do you just need some training resources on bookkeeping? Do you need a financial management system and software in place to do those things? So really want to know that you have everything you need to get the job and get the business, get the job done and get the business up and running. Character uh, fits a little bit differently in the world of co-ops. So again, in a sole proprietorship or lending to an individual, that's where people are kind of looking to their credit scores. They're looking to uh, like references around that individual. You're looking through their history uh, in, in their workforce, things like that. They're looking for partners who can tell you how, they, how well they work with other people. In the, in the world of the co-op, we're, again, we're not looking at one individual, we're looking at that group. Um, so we wanna assess how well does this group work together? Um, how well does this group address challenges or conflicts within its organization? Do the leaders work well together? Do the, are the members engaged in the cooperative? Does everybody really uh, sort of have, have a say in how des decisions are made and how things get done? Um, and sometimes it is helpful to, to get an, uh, an organizational reference, maybe from a local group that you've been, has been helping you or is working with you along the way. It's quite often, especially with a startup, that there is a, a consulting group or a, a TA for technical assistance provider who is helping the, the organization get going. You know, things like NDCC and other groups like that. Um, we're gonna wanna talk with that group. So like, how's your experience been working with these folks? and where do you see some challenges and confirm some of the things that we're seeing with the with the co-op itself? Um, so it's so character is a little bit of a, a slightly different perspective on how we're looking at it. Again, we don't find credit scores to be meaningful. Um, they uh, again, it's a way that has been used to exclude people and and, and sort of misapply experiences and situations uh, to prevent folks from moving forward. So we just don't even bother with those things. Uh, the picture here is folks in, uh, they're actually in kind of based in Milwaukee and Chicago called Darut Consulting Co-op. They do a lot of uh, consulting and training for institutions and organizations around the country on equity issues and race and power dynamics within their organization. Work with a lot of schools, and state organizations. We gave them some working capital to launch some new products and design some new programs. Conditions. So this is where typically we might want to look for a market study or something like a market study. So if we're looking at a, say, a consumer-owned grocery store co-op and they're launching a new co-op and it's a multi-million dollar uh, project, um, we're going to want a full formal market study from a third party that really understands the grocery store world and understands how to assess competition and, and products available and demand for those products. Um, 
But often when we're working as a smaller group, you can't afford a formal market study per se. But then we do want to know that you all have the best sense you can, the best knowledge and information you have to answer these questions for yourselves. And so there may be sort of informal versions of market studies we want to work with the borrower on or the applicant on just to really assess, you know, what is this product you're providing or service you're providing? Um, are you filling a niche or a need that's not being served by someone else? Um, that's great. But if there are other folks that you're going to be competing against, how, how are you going to be successful? Why should people choose your product or service over something else that's out there? Um, and in many sectors and industries, we want to step back and look as best we can around that whole industry. Are there changes going on in that industry? Is technology changing how people, and again, to use kind of grocery stores for an example, the way people get food is very different today than it was 15 years ago with online shopping and deliveries and different form, different ways of, of getting the groceries you need into your house. That is going to change how a store operates and how its margins look and things like that. We want to do the best we can to predict if those trends are going in a way that could even make this kind of business obsolete. Um, or it could create new opportunities if you tweak your approach to that business and, and, and uh, provide what's, what's, what's turning out to be a new kind of demand out there. Mark, a question for you. How much weight do you put uh, in, in, in underwriting um, on, 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 on a group having a business plan? We want to have some form of business plan. It may be, it might be a formal SBA style business plan with all of these different things in different ways, or it might be an informal version of a business plan that just describes in your own language how you think about these things. But when I think of uh, what should go into a business plan, ultimately from, from, for my needs, I want your business plan to try to answer all of the questions that we're going through right now. I want them, I want the business plan to show me your projections, your budgets, your pro forma, what you expect, how you expect money to move through the business. I want it to give me some sense of competition and market conditions. I want it to tell me about the capacity of you to get things done and your relationships with other groups in the community. So sometimes, like I said, that comes in a very formal formatted uh, document. Uh, sometimes it comes in, in much less formal ways. As, as long as we can answer those questions and we are confident that you feel confident about the answers that you're producing. Thank you, Brother Ron, for asking that question, because when I um, shared my story, my, one of my questions was the budget versus the narrative and the financial literacy versus the emotional literacy, which is the pulse and the mission as it relates to the co-op and the uh, various communities. So thank you. Yeah. Question. yeah, and to double down on that, you know, we want all of those things that, that you know, and again, unfortunately, in most of the business world, the the uh, the narrative and the emotional literacy aren't even considered of value necessarily. Uh, maybe the narrative as a marketing tool might have value, but in the sense of a cooperative, um, we, we do want those things to be forward. We do want budgets, but we want to know sort of how do you even, how do you understand your own numbers and how do you, uh, how do the folks in your group who may, may understand the numbers help to translate and, and, and bring along the folks that don't, that aren't comfortable with numbers. Um, it's not that everyone in the group needs to be a master at spreadsheets. But I think everyone should have a baseline understanding of like, this is the kind of money we're bringing in. This is the kind of expenses we have. This is what we're going to do with our money at the end of the day. Other thoughts about that? Great. Um, this is a picture of Vital Compass out in Portland, Oregon. So they are a uh, kind of an alternative herbal medicine shop out there. It's a worker-owned business, um, small shop that has been very successful uh, over the last, I think, 10 years or so. They've been operating out there. Uh, good folks doing good work. 
So those were the standard things that most lenders and investors are going to want to look at. That's the kind of questions and the kind of answers they're trying to get. Um, and we touched on some of these things, but I want to call out things that we look for uh, that are particular and somewhat unique to the world of co-ops. And hopefully other lenders, if they're doing their due diligence, are, are looking at these similar things. Um, and, and, you know, uh, to step back for just a moment at Shared Capital, our mission is to create economic democracy. And we see co-ops as the best version of that or the best tool to use to create economic democracy. There are a lot of ways to create economic democracy, but it's the one that we think is sort of uh, the easiest tool for people to use. Um, so we're underwriting the business. We're underwriting those numbers and that business plan and that market but we are also underwriting the democracy. We want to know that it truly is a democratic organization, that it truly is engaging its members in positive ways. And so one of the ways that we look at that is, is the ownership itself. Um, so what is the process for becoming an owner? Um, you may have your initial group, a handful of people that are all working together informally first and then more formally as you move forward. Um, but ultimately things change in people's lives, Priorities change, uh, and so people may step out, and you want to have a clear, transparent process for new people stepping into this business, or as you grow, you bring new worker owners on or member owners on. Um, so having some of that laid out and figured out ahead of time can be very important so that you're not having to figure it out on the fly when suddenly you have a, a gap to fill or an opening to fill. Um, so the more you can think about it ahead of time, the better. Um, that touches on a number of these issues unique to co-ops, um, but these are kind of the first ones that pop to mind. Um, and these kinds of processes are usually laid out in the bylaws or the operating agreement of the cooperative. So how do you become a member? What are the stages of approval? Who approves that? Um, and how do you leave? Um, and we'll touch on that a little bit more, too. This is a folk, some folks in uh, in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, Sustainergy Co-op. They do like energy improvement work and energy efficiency work and kind of solar panel installation kind of stuff out there. Governance. Um, so we've got ownership. We've got the governance itself. Um, like I referenced, sort of what are your policies and procedures for operating the co-op? How are decisions made? You know, there are a number of different ways that you can use as a group to make decisions. You can use Robert's Rules of Order. You can use consensus-based models. You can use other allied-based models of decision-making. We don't uh, direct you to use one or the other, but we want to know that you have a standard approach to making decisions. And part of that is if you've got a transparent and, and understood process for how you make decisions in your group, um, then you also have some of the tools that you need to deal with conflict. So people are people, no matter how long you've been working together, there's going to be some point where you disagree on things and you may disagree strongly on things. Um, and either of those, you know, whatever decision you're making at, either one might be a, a reasonable decision, but you've got to sort of get on the same page around with which path you want to follow. And so having the ability to navigate conflict and, and disagreements, I think, is fundamentally important in a cooperative. Um, and that's really up to you to decide how you want to do that. Some groups have internal processes for that. Some groups actually specify that they will turn to an outside consultant or facilitator to help the group work through those kinds of disagreements and dynamics. That's really one of the biggest tests of a cooperative or any group of people that want to be successful. Um, conflict is inevitable. It's not about avoiding conflict. It's about how you engage with that conflict and work through that as a group to come out the other side. Uh, and this is folks uh, in Atlanta, Pecan Milk in Georgia. Um, they're a uh, worker-owned co-op, uh, folks that are, are producing uh, pecan milk and other nut milks in Atlanta really small scale operations right now. We made a very small equity investment into them. Most of what we do is loans, but we have been doing a few more equity investments along the way. And so we made a, a modest equity investment into them to help them grow their business to the next level. Uh, 
equity and patronage, another element that's unique to the world of co-ops. Um, this has to do with what I was talking about before, about like, what are you doing with your, with your profits? Uh, sometimes in the world of co-ops, people don't talk about profits, they talk about surplus. Um, but either way, whatever language you use, if you're successful, you're going to be making money. What are you going to do with that money? Um, and also questions around that member share. So we already kind of talked about the member share. How much should it be? How big should it be? How do you treat it? Um, and, and an important thing is um, if, if when people leave at whatever time is how are those shared shares paid back out? If it's a small dollar amount, it may be fairly easy for the co-op to write a check. Here's your share back. Here's your fifty, hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. Um, but if it's a slightly larger amount, you want to make sure that a person leaving and asking for their share back doesn't create a real problem for cash flow for the business. And so, typically, the bylaws or agreements will describe a way that a person who's leaving can get paid out over time. Maybe they get paid out over a few years, or as the co-op is, is successful or profitable over time. But you want like, that's another thing that you want to sort of figure out ahead of time and make sure is in your in your agreements. And the uh, again, the surplus or profit from the business at the end of the year, um, there are certain rules around it. So there is a certain percentage uh, that has to be uh, distributed to the workers. Um, in many cases, I believe it's about 20% of any surplus has to go out to the members. But beyond that, it's up to the co-op what to do with it. You may be, you may say as a group, we're going to keep that there to grow the co-op, to expand, to buy new equipment, to do new research, things like that. Or you may pass it through to your members as a dividend payment based on their patronage. Or a third third yeah. option is actually that you allocate it to your members, but you keep it on the balance sheet of the co-op. So it's a, it's money that the members have claim to, but they're not being given it right away. It's still being used by the co-op. So that's another way that members can kind of reinvest in their co-op over time is to take their allocation or a portion of it and let it sit at the co-op so the co-op can use that cash for growth or operations uh, down the road. This is where it can be it can be helpful to have somebody who's, who is familiar with tax uh, options and tax rules because the, the income tax either at the co-op side or at the member side is going to change depending on if you allocate it or pay it out or hold it at the co-op. So there are pros and cons to each of those things for the co-op along the way. Uh, this picture is folks at Happy Earth Cleaning here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, they converted to a worker-owned business about two and a half years ago. Um, and so the previous owners were uh, leaving town, moving on to do other things. And we helped to finance the, the purchase of the business for the workers so they could continue to keep the business going. So where do we start? That's, that's what we got to accomplish. That's the information that we're going to be asked for. How do we think about this process? Uh, oh, and this is folks from uh, a co-op called Adams and Chittenden Scientific Glass Cooperative. Um, I often marvel at the variety of businesses that we work with. We work with all kinds of things. This is fairly unique. This was also was a conversion from a uh, selling owner to the workers. Um, they make basically our glass blowers that make uh, scientific uh, glass parts for universities and research labs and manufacturing facilities that need very particular kinds of test tubes and, and testing equipment and things like that. So uh, it was somewhat difficult to assess the market uh, for that because it's such a unique, uh, detailed uh, uh, market. But we got it figured out and they're doing well. So when, so, you know, thinking about the process here, of applying for a loan or applying for an investment. Again, I wanna come back to what we talked about initially about this is a relationship. And for most folks, um, the business owner, the person doing the borrowing, the person who's asking for the money, um, 
starts out in a kind of a subordinated position or it kind of on, on you know, they, it's a powerless space for most people. Um, and you feel like you're begging and like, was like, well, please give me this money. What do I need to do to get it? Um, and what we want to do is avoid that dynamic at, if at all possible. There is always obviously power in who has the resources and who needs the resources. Um, but we want to do whatever we can to equalize that power and equalize the decision making so that it is truly a relationship that's being built between both parties. Um, but to do that, you need to understand each other. And in many ways, this kind of falls back on sort of like community organizing principles of self-interest. Um, so, uh, you know, you have your interests and your needs in starting your business and getting the resources to do that in a certain way. The lender has their interests and their needs and their priorities and doing what you can to both uh, understand where they're coming from and make sure they understand who you are and what you need um, can go a long ways towards uh, equalizing that as best we can along the way. There is this kind of baseline of, you know, get your stuff, get your ducks in a row, figure out your financials, figure out your business plan. Uh, make sure, and it's, some of this comes back again to um, kind of as best you can, getting everybody on the same page around what is this business about? What are your plans? Um, how are you going to get this thing done? How are you going to be successful? And so um, a lot of internal training, um, kind of cross training, uh, self-education or working with a consultant or TA provider to, to figure that out. So that you can feel confident when you walk into that room or, or start that phone call um, to have that conversation. Again, your ability to answer the questions as best you can um, is going to equalize that power. <clears throat> so the folks on the other side uh, shouldn't assume that they're going to have the upper hand on everything. Co-op Home Care Associates happens to be the largest worker cooperative in the United States. They've got several thousand members in New York City that do home care services um, and uh, incredible organization that's been around for quite a while. Was there a question? Okay. Um, part of that kind of making your case, and this does get to that narrative question, Antoine, again, of like, how do you, what, what story are you telling about yourself? Uh, why are you doing this? How are you doing this? People talk about this kind of value proposition. So what what value are you bringing to your market, to that to that space, to your community? Um, that your narrative is, again, just as important as the numbers and the plan um, in telling kind of the the that emotional <coughs> side, that personal side, um, the story of why why you're doing this and why this is important to you. We do sometimes get applicants, especially for startups, um, that uh, may not have quite figured out kind of some of these questions. And often when I ask sort of, well, why, well, you know, this, the, there are already being books sold in your community or there's already coffee being sold in your community. Why, why should anybody come to you for that? And their answer is often because we're a co-op. And uh, that unfortunately is not the best answer. Um, because while some people are able to and do choose where they spend their money based on values, um, most people do not. They, ba they base it on convenience and quality and consistency and the experience of, of shopping in that store or working with this business. And so the co-op um, kind of buzzword and the, the co-op as a co-op ability to bring customer in customers in is an element of your market. Uh, but you should never assume that that will trump quality or performance or or affordability or the other things that at the end of the day are actually uh, going to influence more people uh, uh, about whether they're going to use your business or not. Uh, that's a shot of Firestorm Books in North Carolina, in Asheville, um, kind of a small radical bookshop there. Uh, that is also serves as kind of a community space and they do a lot of support for small uh, other small enterprises and businesses in their neighborhood uh, and have done fairly well. Bookshops are hard, just like grocery stores are very hard. Bookstores have been very hard um, and they've found a way to figure it out. 
And then ultimately just, you know, do you do your the best you can to be prepared. As we all know, things change, life changes, communities change, uh, you know, natural disasters happen, politics happens. Um, and so, yes, be clear about what how you're going to accomplish things and what you're going to do, but also be ready for changes. Be ready, give yourself cushion and room and space as best you can to react to things that are going to change in your market and 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 in your processes along the way. Um, and this is something that I think lenders need to understand as well, is that, you know, uh, due to a lot of political dynamics, of course, and race and class and other things that that drive how things are structured, um, most folks don't get a second chance or most folks uh, a lot of folks don't get a chance to stumble, uh, stand up again, dust themselves off, figure out and get back on track. And so the way we approach lending and, and I think the way that those other co-op lenders approach lending and a healthy lending relationship is going to mean that the lender is going to give you space to make some mistakes or address some surprises that come along the way, fix those things and get back on track. If you don't have space within your lending relationship or investor relationship to do that, that's probably not going to be a good place to get your resources. So, and how that plays out kind of practically speaking is if you miss a payment, is the lender going to call the note the next day um, or even a month later, or, or how are they going to react to that? If you see some, if a struggle happens in your business that is uh, unforeseen, or dust, or, or or unforeseen, or or um, or out of your control, um, a, a good lender or investor should understand that they need to give you space to figure that out. Um, and so I think um, uh, I, you know the the way that that plays out practically for us is uh, if folks miss a payment or we see some struggles happening or some changes happening in their market. We're going to sit down and adjust the terms of the loan to respond to that. That might mean giving a business a longer interest-only phase on their loan, so so they so they don't have to pay as much for a longer period of time, so they can get back up to speed. It may be uh, payment forbearance. It may be pushing things out. It may be reamortizing the loan uh, down the road to give give you more cash flow room. Things like that. Um, but if a lender isn't sort of doesn't understand those dynamics and isn't willing to consider those things, at least, um, I would think seriously about walking away if you can. That's what I had to share with folks today. Um, I'm happy to spend as much time as we want here on uh, kind of digging into any of the things we talked about, uh, talking about things that we that I didn't bring up that you might have questions about. Um, or kind of go in any direction with stuff here. Um, and uh, this is where you can reach me or uh, one of my coworkers, Esther, one of our other loan officers, um, if you want to talk more about, about any of this stuff. I have a question. Just curious, what has happened uh, with uh, you guys' rates? What, what are your typical rates and what has happened with them, you know, and terms of what we've been going through in the economy recently? Yeah. So for us and for, I think, most of the lenders that I had on the CDFIs I had on the list, but not all of them, our rates have not changed. And that has to do with, um, you know, most mission-based lenders are not necessarily attaching their rates to, like, economic indicators. And so the economy around us can move up and down and in different directions. And we're able to be fairly consistent in, in our rates and what we're charging. For us, I can't speak a whole lot to other lenders, but for shared capital, um, our rates have been essentially the same uh, for the eight years that I've been working for the organization. And the one way that they may have changed is that we've actually been able to bring our rates down for commercial real estate lending. So they were a little bit on the high side historically, and we've nudged them down a little bit. Um, most of our business loans are somewhere between seven and eight, eight and a half percent. Um, so that could be anything from equipment to, to vehicles to 
working capital, things like that. Most of our real estate loans are somewhere between five and a half and six and a half. And again, like I said, we're, we're trying to get those even lower where we can. Um, and so a lot of that has to do with where our money comes from. You know, I talked to earlier, I talked about the what drives the decision making for a lender. One of them was sources of capital. Um, so we we have some sources that are um, very low or no interest rate money that we can then kind of pass along those savings or kind of blend it within our portfolio so that we can match it up against some of the more expensive money to be consistent with the rates that we're charging our borrowers. Um, but we're kind of two steps removed from those economic indicators. I would say that if things went very bad in the rest of the global economy or the national economy and were consistently bad for several years, it probably would start to affect our rates because the people we turn to investors as for investors might start to charge us more or demand more or demand different things. And eventually we have to kind of pass that through to our borrowers. But for the most part, we're able to cushion people against that. Other questions or things they want to check in around? Great. Well, well Mark, well, seemed like you did a good job. <laughs> I, I hope so. Well, thank everybody for their time and listen to me chat at you for a while. Thank you. Good information. Thanks so much, Mark. Sure. All right. All right. Well, Mark, thank you for your presentation today. And uh, thank you uh, for all you do um, in terms of building out the space for for cooperatives. Um, uh, so if anyone doesn't have any more questions, I'll let Mark sign off on us. All right. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, great. Thanks, everyone. Have Thank a good you. weekend. Thank Thanks, you. Mark. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that, that was a very informative session, particularly when you start looking down the road at um, securing financing. He gave a lot of um, tidbits in terms of what you should look at and how you should build out your platform prior to going and seeking financing. So, um, so, so if you get any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Mark. He's in the, he's in your directory as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, uh, do you want to cover anything uh, that we we need to cover before we let everyone go? Yep. So we have um, before we go today, uh, I'm just gonna ask everyone to take five minutes, even maybe less than five minutes, to fill out a very short um, feedback survey we have on the academy. It's just all multiple choice questions, one comment section if you're in, if you'd like to comment. Um, so I'm just going to share the link now and uh, ask people to just fill it out while you're here. And then also um, some reminders before I send out the survey. Um, so please send me um, pictures and bios if I'd asked you to. Um, and then uh, also, please complete your homework assignments. Yeah, uh, complete the the academy. Yeah, um, I I've been fortunate to meet with three three of the groups already, um, and and it was a learning experience for me just to 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 learn what the groups are working on, how they see themselves, uh, growing their cooperatives, um, and how they see themselves doing the work. Um, so I I really appreciate uh, those that have have shared uh, with me in one-on-one -on -one discussion. Um, getting back to the survey, uh, we're, we're just trying to measure uh, our effectiveness in terms of, uh, uh, of how we do what we do. And so uh, and, and so we need to, to have your feedback in, in, in that uh, discourse so that we can understand what we're doing and how we can change some of the format in terms of what we're doing uh, to better meet the needs of, of, of 
of those who are looking at developing cooperatives. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, we've been asking for photos and, and, and bios for a while now, since the beginning. And, and some of you have responded and some of you have not. And, um, and that's okay. But um, uh, again, we, 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 we're trying to uh, profile uh, you and your work also trying to profile and elevate the work that we're doing here in this Black Cooperonomics Academy. And so we're looking again at, 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 the, at the spring and fall of 23 and, and seeing what can we do to better enhance this experience for those who are coming into the space. And so, um, so if you can uh, find it within yourself to, to, to respond uh, to Anna and and uh, give her your bios and, and your photos so she can post it up on social media. That would certainly be helpful uh, to uh, to us. Uh, we have our last session next week, and um, so I will be just covering um, some of the uh, more of the history on Black cooperatives and the pathway that that we've gone through in terms of claiming the space in terms of cooperative businesses and. Uh, Hopefully, um, I think that we expected at least one other presenter in the space as well. Uh, we're waiting to get his confirmation um, uh, to date. So uh, without further ado, um, go ahead, Anna, and send out the, the, the link for the survey and, and let folks go ahead and, um, uh, um, yeah, go ahead and, and complete it. Yep, so the link is in the chat. Um... If everyone can just complete it, uh, I think after people are done with the survey, we don't need anything else right now, Ron. No, no, no. They can. They're free to go. Okay, great. Yep. So as soon as you finish the survey, um, please feel free to log off. Um, and I guess Eric, um, it's good to hi. Uh, it's good to have you here. Uh, we just want to speak with you about the one on ones. Because Roxy mentioned that you're the one who will be, you know, uh, responsible for setting that up for Agri Unity. So if, uh, right. we can, yeah, we can discuss this now or after you're done with the survey. Or I guess, uh, yep. But up to you. Yeah, I'm working on the survey now. Okay, thank you. I'm done with the survey. Do you want to speak with me? Yep, we can speak right now. That's fine. We just, um, you know, because we're just setting up the time. Uh, so we just, yeah, uh, we wanted to see, you know, uh, when you would be available to meet with Ron. And um, yeah, yep. Anytime. Yeah, he can call me. Yeah, Ron. Ron I think Ron has been. Oh, uh, Ron. Yeah, he can call. Uh, me. Yeah, I'm. I'm looking at my calendar now. Um, how about Tuesday, Eric? Yeah, that, that should work. I'll be back uh, what in time? The... What time? Oh really anytime, bro. Really anytime. All right. Anytime well, that's I... convenient for you, because that's almost like a vacation week, even though I take to be working. So yeah, okay, anytime. Well, I I look at calling you at ten ten o'clock Eastern Standard Time. All right. All right. We'll we'll talk then. Okay. okay then. I'll send the meeting invite to you both. Okay. Okay. All right, Window and Antoine, um, I'd like to uh, 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 um, uh, uh, further talk with you about the Return to Citizens program. I had a meeting this week with uh, John Brothers with the um, uh, T. Rowe Price uh, uh, Foundation, 
and and he he mentioned um uh some work around him wanting to do some work around returning citizens so i, I want to sort of uh, um uh see how we can elevate the discussion around uh providing a a, a pathway for growing a uh, uh growing your uh, uh cooperative particularly with reference to returning Perfect. citizens For sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, count me in. And uh, yeah, you just let me know how that can be arranged or, you know, what your mindset is on that. But uh, yeah, for sure. Okay, all right. Uh, I, I, I know John Brothers, um, or at least we had some interaction a couple of years back. I haven't seen him in a while. Yeah, well, he seems to be um, um, in a different space than he was. Uh, when but, I met him. Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, we can certainly have that conversation. Um, and, uh, I blacked Rod out for a minute. I, I didn't hear your response. No, I was saying that yeah, certainly we can have that conversation. Oh, all right, great. Uh, um, well, um, um, how how do how does Tuesday look for you to look look for you to to to, to engage in the conversation around 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 your cooperative and building it out? It works for me. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what time is convenient? For oh you. well, I just scared, just scared, uh, just schedule Eric for ten o'clock. So anytime after eleven, between eleven and and uh, uh two forty-five, uh, it's, it's good for me. Eleven between eleven and two forty-five, that mm -hmm. works for me as well. How, How about, about two? Two o'clock. Uh, well, that's getting. Well, can we do uh one thirty? One thirty, yeah. Yes, works for me. Okay then. That works for me, Bill. Okay. Thank you for following through, Reverend Ron. Kept oh. the word. I appreciate that. All right. Uh Anna, uh, can you um um put a, a calendar invite together for 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 this meeting at 1.30 on, on Tuesday as well? Yep. What should I call this meeting? Uh, with, uh, uh the Antoine Bennett meeting. <laughs> I'm just joking, Anna. I'm being humble. <laughs> Humbly hilarious. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll just call it um, like NDCC and Charles Johnson Park landscape. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, now wait a second. When you schedule the meetings, are we scheduling on 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 your platform or my platform? Uh, it should be on Google Meets. No, no, so, no. Oh, just on Google Meets. Yeah. So, but I, I noticed that when, when you schedule, you you have a, a shorter window than I do. Oh, I guess it's maybe you have different like Google accounts. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have the business account. You have the regular account. Um, mm -hmm. That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll schedule um, the meeting with Eric and, 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 and Window and, and Antoine. Okay. All right. Well, I guess uh, I can also maybe change the meeting time to be a little longer, but I don't know if it allows me to like run long meetings. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so I I'll, I'll go ahead and schedule that. All right, all right. So I sent out the meeting with um invite for Eric already. So I'll delete that one. Okay then. All right. All right, gentlemen, we're we're on for Tuesday at 1 30. Sounds good. Thank all you. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. You both complete the survey? I did. I did. Yeah. All right. Okay. Great. And, and 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 Anna, I will respond uh today on on, on that uh, email that you sent. Yes. Yes. We would like to get that 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 social media post out there. All right. I'll I'll respond today. Okay. Then thank you. Thank uh -huh. you so much. All right. And Wendell's response will be my response. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I follow the lead on that one. All right. 
right. Anna, are you still there? Still there? Yes. Uh, I'm just having problems with my computer. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um,